Okay. Let's start. Um, please take seat. We will go on with our next session, Inclusion to Innovation. When we um, started with the first planning for our symposium, maybe two years ago, there we thought we should create a platform for, yes, companies and uh, upcoming products for, uh, yes, with interest for us, Asha people. And so we uh, decided to, yes, um, start with uh, our session or to create a session inclusion to innovation. And um, now we have four companies or four um, approaches, very interesting things, um, which will um, yes, um, show us their, their newest um, approaches and uh, products. And um, our idea is that we are going to have um, 10 minutes talks or 10 minute presentation and after the presentation we have time for a few questions my uh, our first presentation will be held by um, Maria Mutsayi she is coming from the Moorfield Eye Hospital from the University College London so, um, yes, are you ready? Ready. Okay, then. <laughs> so, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I wanted to say thank you for inviting me to speak at this conference. The last two days of the scientific meeting have been inspirational and very informative, and I think there is a real push towards moving towards clinical translation and therapies. So today I'm going to talk about clinical trial design for nonsense suppression therapy for USH2A, Usher's disease. So to start with, I'm just going to just quickly go over what a nonsense mutation is. Now this is a single change in a letter in your genetic code within an instruction part of the gene that leads to the introduction of an abnormal stop signal. And these are actually quite common mutations. They can account for up to 70% of human genetic disease. Now what happens in your cells normally is you have protein making machinery that reads the instruction parts of genes to create protein. When you have a nonsense mutation or an abnormal stop signal, when your protein making machinery hits that stop, it just stops. And so you end up with shortened non-functional protein. And this is what ultimately leads to the disease process. So what we've done is we've identified a number of small molecule drugs, and the one that I'm going to talk about today is atalurin, which has um, been commercialized by a company called PTC Therapeutics. But when this drug atalurin binds to that protein-making machinery, it weakens its recognition of that abnormal stop signal and can override it, leading to the production of normal full-length protein. And it's able to do that so it generates around 20 to 25% of normal USH2A or whichever protein that you're missing. And that can be enough in our patients to actually halt or slow the disease progression down. So atalurin has a large body of evidence for various different conditions, multi-systems, and including retinitis pigmentosa, and genes such as USH2A, USH1C, and various others. It has approval for treatment in Europe and in the UK for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy for patients which have nonsense mutations. And the drug itself is safe and tolerable to be used in children from two years onwards. It's a powder that is, that is dissolved in water and is drunk three times a day. And so far, there have only been minimal side effects. So transient diarrhea or nausea when you first start taking the drug, which subsides after about a week. But there have been no serious adverse effects or any serious ocular events. And they've treated nearly over 1,000 patients with um, five to eight years follow-up now. 
And currently, there is a phase two clinical trial for aniridia, a different eye condition, where children are born without the colored part of their eyes, their iris, and they develop cataracts, they have glaucoma, and they can um, have wobbly eyes, nystagmus, so they're, they're born with poor vision. So this trial is underway, and we hope to see the results of that in 2020. Now, we want to apply this drug to ushers, and in order to do that in a clinical trial setting, we need to know what the outcome measures would be so we can monitor a response to treatment. So what we started to do was a natural history study of our patients with USH 2A at Moorfields. We, had, we, we selected 57 patients that had, on average, three clinical visits one year apart. So we have many more patients, but these were ones with good data sets. And of those 57, they were almost equally divided. A third had nonsense mutations, and that actually is um, a depiction of our cohort generally. In Usher's syndrome, type 2, Usher 2A, 30% are due to nonsense mutations. And then a third were insertions and deletions, and 17 were missense mutations. The average age of that cohort was 40 years, and it ranged between um, patients that were 15 to 66 years of age. The first thing we did is look at their visual acuity, their central visual acuity. And there's a graph behind me on the screens, and there's a lot of blue dots and a lot of lines connecting it. But essentially, if you can see, there are quite a few horizontal lines, which means that over time, the vision didn't change very much. And so visual acuity isn't the best indicator of a treatment response over a minimal, minimal um, period of time. We then looked at another parameter, something called optical coherence tomography, or OCT. It's a scan that most of you will have each time you go to see your clinician. And it's where we shine infrared light into the back of the eye and we take a cross-section. Um, and what we did is we measured the area where you had intact light-sensing cells, your photoreceptors. And we measured that area, it's called the ellipsoid zone length, over a three-year period. And what we found was that on average, across the whole range of patients, we detected a 7% reduction in that size of uh, length of the ellipsoid zone over a one-year period, but a 22% change over three years. So we are detecting a change over a year, but the issue that we have is that there is a, a measurement bias, an error that is introduced by um, a, people who are measuring that length. And so to be absolutely accurate, we felt that a one-year time point was on the cuff of where you would detect a treatment response. But if you look at the graph as well, you can see that if we looked at patients younger than 30 years of age, the dots indicate um, a patient and the lines joining them are the, the change over time. And the younger patients have more steeper lines showing a steeper decline, whereas the older patients that were 30 plus, their, their lines are much more gentle, so there's not much change going on. And so if we were to do a trial, the best cohort to detect the biggest change would be the younger patients. Another imaging modality we looked at is something called fundus autofluorescence. Again, this would be routinely undertaken in your clinic visits, where we shine a very bright flash of light into the eye. And in Usher syndrome, we get this characteristic bright ring around your area of central vision. And we can draw a line around that ring. And that ring, the reason that it's bright is because the supporting layer of your light-sensing cells called the retinal pigment epithelium, um, it has a buildup of uh, metabolo me metabolite products that cause it to hyperfluoresce. And this is showing that the, the cells are present, but they're sick. They're not working very well because they're burdened by the, this buildup of product. And so they, they autofluoresce, they shine brightly. Now, over time, those cells that were under stress and are sick are dying off. And so that ring is encroaching into your area of central vision and getting smaller over time. And so we measured it at one year and at three years. And what we found that on average, 
there was an 11% reduction in that ring size over a one-year period, and after three years, a 32% change. So this is probably a better parameter than all of the others, but if we combine them all, we're more likely to um, be able to gauge an effect. So then we come to the clinical trial design. So we had patient discussion groups at Moorfields, and some of the members that came to that are actually in the audience here. And one of the biggest things that they said was they didn't feel comfortable with a trial where you were treating a set of patients and giving the other set a placebo and not giving that other set of patients the opportunity to ever have the drug treatment. So we decided to have a crossover trial. One, because this is a rare disease and we need to maximize the number of patients who are on treatment, but we're giving everyone an opportunity to be on the drug, but also it will inform us about what happens after you stop the drug. So by, by having a group that's on atelurin and then having a small washout period, the drug can be washed out of your body system after just a month. Um, and then just following those patients on a placebo, we'll be able to see if the change of decline, if the rate of that ring constriction or loss of those light sensing cells remains stable or when do they start to decline again? And we felt that we needed a two-year period to be absolutely safe, to be able to gauge whether there was a change at all. So this is what we've decided. Around 20 patients would be on atelurin and 20 would be on a placebo and then have a washout period. And then the, the patients that were on the placebo would then be given the drug to see if that would slow down their degeneration. And the other 20 patients would continue on a placebo and we would monitor the effect of the drug. For the outcome measures of the trial, this drug has never been tested on a population with retinal disease. So working with the company, it was felt that the primary outcome measure should be safety to ensure that there were no adverse effects. And as secondary outcome measures, we would consider measuring the uh, autofluorescent ring size, using OCT to look at that ellipsoid zone, but we would also look at visual acuity because even though those cells which were brightly fluorescing were sick, they were still alive. And if we could provide protein to them by the mechanism of the drug action, then maybe they would start working better and maybe the vision would improve slightly. So we want to include that. And then there are a number of other tests that we would include um, as um, exploratory parameters like visual fields, color vision, adaptive optics. So how can you get involved? The first step always is to establish your genetic diagnosis. If you don't know the gene that is causing your condition, I urge you to seek out your clinicians to get genetic testing. If you do know the gene, then it's important to find out what type of mutation because if you have a nonsense mutation, then this therapy may benefit you in the future. And the fact that this drug works on a mutation, it doesn't matter what gene causes it or what the name of your disease is. If you have a nonsense mutation, you may benefit from this. And if the trial is successful, we hope to move to a phase three clinical trial where we would involve patients with all different retinal disorders caused by nonsense mutations. Um, if there is a natural history study underway near where you live, please participate in that, especially if you're unsure about going into treatment trials, because by allowing clinicians to study your disease, it gives us insights. It helps us to develop therapies, and it helps us with the outcome measures of trials. And if any of you have any questions or you'd like me to check your genetic mutation, then please feel free to contact me using my email address, which is Maria dot musagi at moorfields.nhs.uk and if you need that I'm sure that the Usher conference will circulate that and so with that I would just like to thank my team and special credit to Dr. Adam Dubis who really led on the natural history study thank you very much thank you, thank, thank you very much we have now time for, I guess, one question. I don't see any hands. So maybe you can also use the opportunity to write uh, 
Maria an email. So please feel free.